Once this mighty river floated paddle wheels and showboats and a raft of Huckleberry Finn. Today, these waters flow to endless lines of commerce to the heart of mid-America. And this transition from rafts to diesel towboats has presented the need for a vast continuing project to accommodate our expanding society. A challenge to engineering skill and know-how. A challenge which we call the Mississippi Challenge. Some of the early explorers called it Conception River. The people who live along it say old myths. But to those who work on the river, like the crew of the U.S. Corps of Engineers Dredge Thompson, this is the river of big boats. Because they help do the work to keep those big boats moving. This is the story of the upper and middle Mississippi. The principal job of the Thompson is to keep the river channels open to accommodate the endless line of commerce moving along the upper Mississippi. Generally, this work starts in early spring and is a continuing job until late fall or early winter. Captain Fiedler speaking. Over. This is Colonel Brown, Captain. How are things on the Thompson? Over. She's all checked out. We're ready to start the season. Over. Fine. It looks as if your first job of the season is somewhat of an emergency, Captain. A sandbar has developed at mile 763 at the mouth of the Chippewa River, just below Lake Pepin. It's apparently a good-sized one located on the east side of the channel. We want to be certain that the channel is clear before the navigation season gets underway. Over. Colonel, could you send me a report on the type of material in the nearest disposal area? Over. Yes. Mr. Hauser, Chief of Operations, is right here. Captain Fiddler has several questions, Mr. Hauser. Would you brief him, please? Yes, I will. Hello, Captain. The bar is soft, sandy material and shouldn't give you any trouble. On your chart, you'll notice a good spoil area along the east bank close by. Your discharge line should not interfere with river traffic. We would estimate that you should finish this work in about two or three weeks. Fine. Colonel? Well, good luck, Captain. Please keep us informed of your progress. Over. Thank you, Colonel. Well, mate, you've heard it. We've got our first job of the season. At the mouth of the Chippewa River, Reed's Landing, mile 763. Be ready to cast off at 10 hundred hours. see this commerce-laden river in its middle and upper reaches, it's difficult to picture such a tremendous river originating from such an insignificant breath. Like a small fleecy cloud on a quiet day can herald an approaching storm, the mighty Mississippi is born amid the quietness of Lake Itasca a little lake surrounded by forests in northern Minnesota, about 100 miles from Canada. The name Mississippi comes from the Algonquin Indian language, Missy, which means great, and Sippy, which means river. At the point of its origin is a little rapids breaking from the Lake Itasca shoreline. You can almost step across it. And from this point, it meanders in a winding path across the scenic countryside, insignificant, unimpressive and apparently undecided as to which way to flow. For the first 60 miles, the little river flows northeast as though trying to reach Hudson Bay. And then it turns east and finally south. 
winding its way 2,350 miles from Lake Itasca to the Gulf of Mexico. Along the way, the Mississippi and its tributaries draw water from 31 states, draining 40% of the United States and 13,000 square miles of Canada, serving as a drainage for over 1,244,000 square miles of land. The great Mississippi has always played a prominent role in American history. And probably her most dramatic role was played during the 1800s. The golden age of the riverboat. In 1849, there were 1,000 big packets flying the river. Following the Civil War, water transportation was eclipsed by the Iron Horse, and there was an era of little activity on the Father of Waters. But two world wars coupled with the introduction of the modern diesel towboat and large steel barges changed the picture when the government revived water traffic to relieve transportation congestion. And this traffic did not stop when the war stopped, for since the war, tonnages have showed a continuous increase year after year. And the task of maintaining the river to serve the people and the industries of the Great Valley presents a continuing job to the Corps of Engineers. The Dredge Thompson, under the command of Captain Fiedler, is one of the largest along the Upper Mississippi. She measures 267 feet long, 50 feet wide, with a draft of 6 feet. A cutter head, 6 feet in diameter, extends about 30 feet in front of the dredge. This cutter head operates like a meat grinder, rotating and cutting up the river bed. A powerful winch is used to raise or lower the cutter head. Literally, the dredge Thompson is a giant waterborne vacuum cleaner. It sucks material up from the river bed and pumps it on to dumping areas. Principally, the Thompson and her crew operate along the upper Mississippi between Minneapolis and Saverton, Missouri. The pumping action of the big dredge is accomplished by a powerful 1,000 horsepower engine, which pumps the dredged material on through a pontoon-supported pipeline to the dumping area. Since the late 1930s, Captain Fiedler has worked along the upper Mississippi, maintaining this busy waterway, and his memories cover almost three decades of activity. I've worked on this river for more than 30 years, and before that, my father did the same. In those days, there were many unimproved areas along the river. I well remember when many of the locks and dams along the upper Mississippi were constructed. Projects like the construction of Lock 12 at Bellevue, Iowa. This job was started in 1934. During that same year, work was started on the construction of Lock 10 at Guttenberg, Iowa. Both of these projects are a part of the nine-foot channel development along the upper Mississippi. My father worked on many of the early navigation projects along the river, and it was probably because of him that a career with the Corps of Engineers on the Mississippi was really the one job I could think of. Yes, old Miss has seen many changes during the years. In early days, the boats and barges had a little draft, and wing dams were used to confine the flow of the river to the center of the channel and maintain channel depths. In periods of high water like this, only the buoy and the current flow tells us where the wing dam is. The steamboat era and the paddle wheel is gone. But the mighty Mississippi is more alive today than at any time in history. Significantly, upper Mississippi commercial traffic has increased more than 10 times in the 20 years since the locks and dams along the upper Mississippi were completed and petroleum and its products rank high among the commodities transported on the river. Grain from the corn belts and wheat belts of the great Midwest 
is stored in Riverside elevators and later transferred to river barges for movement to the flour mills of St. Paul and Minneapolis. Or markets like Chicago, and often destined for transshipment to foreign ports. Great quantities of coal move overland from the mines of Kentucky, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and southern Illinois to the river docks where it is loaded on barges and shipped by water. Sulfur is another important commodity. This product comes from the south, from the docks of New Orleans and St. Louis, headed upbound for the northern industrial centers. Sand, gravel, and other building materials rank high among the cargo commodities shipped on the Mississippi. The average barge on the Mississippi weighs about 350 tons and can carry up to 1,500 tons of cargo. It also costs about $85,000 to build. One modern diesel towboat can handle the fleet of 20 or more such barges. Actually, the name towboat is misused because these boats don't tow, they push their string of barges. The average tow carries a crew of from 15 to 17 and can push a string of barges carrying the load of two ocean-going freighters. Of course, as water transportation increased, so did navigation requirements. Channels had to be deepened, and water levels had to be controlled. And Congress delegated the Army's Corps of Engineers the responsibility of accomplishing these controls. Today, a system of locks and dams along the upper Mississippi, like this number four lock and dam at Alma, Wisconsin, provide for a nine-foot navigation channel for modern towboats and barges. Between Minneapolis and St. Louis, Missouri, a system of 29 locks and dams create a stairway of water for a barge channel nine feet deep, which river tows climb or descend as they travel up or downstream. In this distance of 673 miles, the Mississippi drops about 412 feet. This system was constructed by the Corps of Engineers not for flood control, but to meet the needs of upper Mississippi commercial navigation. The locks and dams create a series of pools of suitable depth to accommodate the endless flow of barges and tows. The system, therefore, remains a part the Army Engineers Flood Control Program on this important waterway. Army Engineers operate the dams after precise evaluation of water stages, route of flows, precipitation and temperature, hydraulic and hydrologic data, and operation and storage curves. To properly operate the dams, they must first know what tributaries contribute to the inflow into the pool. Thus, a system of warning stations keep a constant check on the extent of those inflows and relay their information to the central control force. And computations by the central control force is then relayed on to the locks and dams. In this profile showing the relationship of the dams and pools, we see how water levels in the pools are controlled according to conditions. Army engineers use three lines from which to begin their control operation of the dams. The bed of the river, the low water flow line, which affords a depth of from three to six feet. The flat line extending from the top of the dam throughout the pool, indicating the pool elevation. And the high flow line, which is that portion of the ground flooded annually and which is federal property. Where the flat line and the high water line intersect, a primary control point is designated. This is the stable portion of the pool, and the operation revolves about this point. Assuming there was no flow in the river and the pools were filled completely, the pools would be long, narrow, flat lakes at least nine feet deep. As the inflow increases, the dams are opened, and the pool tilts slightly. The control point acts as a fulcrum. With increasing flows, the pool is drawn down at the lower end. As the tailwater rises, the pool is tilted additionally until there ceases to be an appreciable drop at the dam. As the river recedes back, the upward tilt continues until projected pool levels are achieved throughout the entire pool. 
Rainfall occurring as much as two or three weeks prior could affect the flows at the dams today, even though no rain has fallen in the immediate vicinity. This is governed by nature, not by man. But it can be seen that the dams reduce the fluctuation and are particularly effective in preventing extremely low readings during low water periods. In addition to navigation and other interests, this control is also important to fish and wildlife interests along the Upper Mississippi. The entire Upper Mississippi area is one of nature's greatest playgrounds. For these waters are filled with a wide variety of game fish and attract thousands of sportsmen annually. Some fish for sport and pleasure, others fish for a livelihood. Commercial fishing along the upper Mississippi is a big business. These people are particularly interested in conservation efforts and the role conservation plays in keeping this area a natural habitat for fish and wildlife. Of course, not all of the fish are intended for the consumer market. Great quantities of the catches wind up as cat food or fertilizer. For those interested in other forms of water recreation, Congress has authorized and the Corps of Engineers has built many small boat harbors along the river. Some of these luxurious houseboats are literally floating palaces, and hundreds of them cruise upper Mississippi waters during summer months. Some of the busiest water highways in the nation are found along the upper Mississippi, where virtually all types of watercraft, anything that floats, dot the open channels, the backwaters, and the tributaries. The vacationists who find pleasure in more active recreations find these waters ideal for the popular sport of water skiing, and some of the skiers rank with the best in the country. Those who appreciate scenic grandeur find this area a photographer's paradise. This is a land of high limestone bluffs, great wooded areas, picturesque hills and broad rolling valleys. While some travel by houseboat, others travel by trailer, haunting out of the way river roads to camp and play along the banks of the great Mississippi. And when summer grows old and the early frost strike the woodlands, the whole countryside becomes a panorama of color with red and gold leaves, blue skies, and blue water. In mid-autumn, the hunters arrive with dogs to comb the lowlands in the open country for pheasants. There is an abundance of wildlife along the upper Mississippi, and very few go back empty-handed. From mid to late fall, the ducks arrive, and so do the hunters, literally by the thousands. These lowlands, areas of wild rice and lush feeding grounds, provide hunters with some of the finest shooting in the country. Adding to the system of locks and dams, two new locks are being constructed at Minneapolis, Minnesota, to serve this metropolitan area of one and one half million people. The upper lock will raise or lower boats 50 feet, which is the highest lift on the Mississippi. The lower lock, all 
already constructed and ready for operation has a lift of 25 feet. The purpose of the two locks is to bypass St. Anthony Falls and extend the benefits of the improved Upper Mississippi into the center of Minneapolis industry and to an area of excellent harbor sites and railroad and highway networks. For the first time, new frontiers of Minnesota and the upper Midwest will be served by water transportation. The height that a vessel is lifted or lowered at the different locks varies widely according to the location of the lock. At Keokuk, Iowa, the lift is more than 32 feet. This mammoth 1,200-foot long lock is presently the largest lock along the Mississippi River. The immense concrete tank with as much water capacity as a small lake fills to the level of the upper pool in about 10 minutes. Most of the locks along the Mississippi, like this one at Rock Island, Illinois, run 600 feet long and 110 feet wide. The operation of drawbridges, as well as permits for the construction of all structures in and over navigable waterways, are subject to approval by Army engineers to meet modern navigation requirements. Toes often find it necessary to break up their barge trains in order to enter the lock. Generally, it requires about 30 minutes to put a vessel through a lock. The actual operation of a lock is a relatively simple study in hydraulics. When a vessel enters the lock from the upper stream, the gate at the front end of the tow is in a closed position, and the water level in the lock is at the same level as the upper stream. When the vessel is entered, the gate at the rear of the tow is closed. Then a system of valves and pipes release the water from the lock into the lower stream, thus lowering the vessel to the level of the lower stream. Then the gate in front of the tow is opened and the vessel proceeds en route. When a vessel enters a lock upbound, the procedure is reversed. Now, water is let into the lock from the upper pool at a controlled rate until the water level in the lock reaches the same level as the upper pool. Then the gate at the front of the tow is opened and the vessel proceeds en route. Pumps are not necessary in a locking operation. It's the old principle that water seeks its own level. The modern towboat is the result of years of development. Some of them cost well over a million dollars and are equipped with four engines and deliver as much as 8,500 horsepower. In addition to serving the industrial and commercial interests, this lock and dam system along the upper Mississippi also serves recreation and pleasure purposes of the general public. And in recent years, the number of small craft using the lock has increased tremendously. Boating enthusiasts using navigable water now number over 28 million, and the number is increasing at a phenomenal rate. Recognizing these factors, the Corps of Engineers have geared their educational program to the promotion of greater safety along the waterways. Safety literature and navigation charts 
are available at any of the Corps of Engineer district offices. The task of keeping this mighty river under control to serve business, industrial, and military needs is a continuing challenge to the Corps of Engineers, for their work concerns both military and civilian, and it engages considerably more than field activities and construction. They have the added responsibilities of planning, design, investigations, conducting economic analysis surveys, and relating the results of those surveys to future design and planning, a work geared to the continuing increase in population and to the constant expansion of business and industry. And so the story of man and the river continues. For as traffic volumes on the mighty Mississippi continue to increase, so do the needs for additional improvements and additional controls designed to improve the river's service to business and industry and to the people of the great sprawling valley, people who live along the river and know the mighty waters like blood relations, people who have seen the Mississippi in all of her moves and who fully appreciate the work, the manpower, the planning and design it has taken to domesticate this giant and gear it to the needs of a modern, expanding society. These people live with her habits and her passions. They've heard the poet's call her father of water. Today, she is one of the busiest inland waterways that exists on the face of the earth. <laughs> 